Thank you. Morning. Morning. But today we don't have that many people. Hey, good morning. Morning. I like your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real throwback, right? It's a throwback it's a now. Yeah. yeah. You remember where it comes from? Coroes, yeah. right? Coroes. I think I have that shirt somewhere. Yeah, it was quite a famous one back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about anybody else, but I struggled to, uh, I haven't joined into this meeting for a while, I must say, but I, I, between having to log in and having to find the passcode and whatever, it was non-trivial to get on this call. So I'm wondering if, if other people are struggling with the same thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe we give them a few more minutes. What, what's the attendance been like recently, Ricardo? Uh, it's, it's been fairly... Um good i think i mean it hasn't been like uh you know 20 or 30 people but typically we get like um you know seven to 12 people right? oh okay so yes. more than today okay cool let's yeah. maybe wait for a while and see if somebody yeah. has to run. we could always i mean it would seem like a waste to to uh i guess we can record it and people can watch the recording because yeah it's I already it's already been recorded yeah so yeah yeah Otherwise, we could postpone till next meeting, I guess. Yeah. Maybe everyone's still busy counting votes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's election. So yeah. people are watching that. Maybe we can just give it a go, right? So, Taylor, do you? Maybe we can. Rec it's going to be recorded anyways, right? Yeah, I mean, we can if you want. <clears throat> the only thing I worry about with just a small audience is it doesn't give a lot of people the chance to ask a lot of questions. Yeah, um, which is I, what I assume people have given the nature of this project, or maybe people have nothing. I never know, but um, a lot of times I'm usually a very noisy. I'm usually a very noisy guy when it comes to asking questions. I, I'll be that that question asker person if we want to go ahead. We we can always repeat it again in a couple of weeks' time if we think it's worth it. Um, but yeah, I mean, given that we're all here, we may as well go ahead and yeah. I'll ask questions. How about that? <laughs> I can ask questions. I, I, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't care either way. I just wanted to make sure that like, I, I figured people wanted us to come present what was going on with Cresslet because uh, they're curious about what it is and probably have a bunch of questions. And so no matter what I present and talk about in demo, I figure people will still have questions. And so that's what I'm trying to just make sure we we give people that opportunity if they want it, but if we're if we think that we can cover most of it here, it's perfectly fine by me. Oh, we we got somebody else, Derek. So, yeah, we can do we can do Q and A on the Slack channel as well um, as as a sort of supplement. It's never the same as a in person, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, the Sigrun Time Slack channel, on the CNCF. So should I just go ahead or you have other things you do first? Go ahead. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. Okay, let me make sure I have everything shared right. I think I got everything in place, but you know, got to double check. Ah, okay. uh, yes, and I didn't have something open that I thought. One second. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Um, I'm I was planning on just showing a few slides. I'm not a big slide person, um, and I figure people want to kind of dive into like how we've done things and what we've architected. But and um, these first things are just kind of cut to cover the purpose. I am reusing them from another slide deck, so forgive the theming, but um, they contain like the perfect information and kind of give some overview about why we did Cressa and when we did it. So um, since this is recording, just an introduction. My name is Taylor Thomas. Um, I am a senior software engineer at Microsoft, um, and I'm uh, one of the lead maintainers on Cresslet, which is a Kubernetes Rust kubelet is what that's, that name derives from, but I'll talk a little bit about that and what it does, why the project exists, and then I'm going to show um, 
some demos and if people are interested kind of like the architecture. So that's that's the kind of general overview of, of what I'm going to cover. So um, let me go ahead and share out my screen, make sure it is Okay. And I'll start the show. Sorry, showed up on the wrong display, as is want to happen. There we go. Okay, so um, just a little bit of background. So what's this whole WASM thing? So the idea of cr the Crossit project is that we, um, we do, it, it was really meant to, to work with WASM. And WASM stands for WebAssembly, if you haven't heard of it. Um, and just a quick overview of that in case it is completely unfamiliar to you. It's basically compiled binaries that can run, be run in a browser through JavaScript. That's how it's mostly been used but it can actually be used to run things outside of a web browser as well. And that's where we introduce another acronym that I'll talk a little bit about as we're doing this called WASI. Um, we like our W's here in this space, um, kind of like Kubernetes likes its K's, we like our W's. Um, so we have um, this thing called WASI that stands for WebAssembly System Interface. There's a landing page right here on this slide. It's a pretty simple one. Um, <clears throat> and what it is is a standard for interacting with the host system no matter what the OS is. So it's a very well-defined um, set of things that you can do right now. It's, it's very new, so there's things that are missing. Like right now, there isn't full networking support, though my uh, other people on my team and in the community are working on some of the initial networking support for, um, for WASI. Um, but it, it has definitions of how you write to a file descriptor um, and, and the security model of of a web assembly that just comes with it. So it's, it's a fine thing. So that way we can run it everywhere. And I'll, and I'll try to show a little bit of that while, um, while demoing today. So, um, uh, quick question while you, while you're going, yeah. would you like us to ask questions along the way or would you prefer us to keep them to the end? You can ask them along the way or, or the end, whatever you prefer. I can, I can handle both ways just fine. Okay, cool. Uh, I was, uh, this was, uh, sounds very interesting. I was just curious, you know, there've been attempts like POSIX, you know, decades ago to do essentially similar things. Uh, how, how does this differ from something like POSIX? So this is a very common uh, question is like, well, people have tried stuff like this before. And when we get a little bit to the security model, people say, well, we tried this before. And the completely uh, blunt and honest answer is, I'm not entirely sure it will be different or not, but there are signs there that a lot of people are, um, are uh, coalescing around this. Now, Now, WASI has, has been the kind of the, the forefront of this. There's lots of efforts in and around the WASM space, but WASM has a distinct advantage because of its, its history of like being used in the browser and has a very common, like these, like I said, it has a very common um, set of things it can do and way of interacting with things and a security model that goes with that. Um, and so it could, it could end up being like, hey, people tried this before like POSIX and it might not end up that way, but there's a very concerted effort in this community right now to um, to get this to a state that could actually be used on all systems. And even right now, even with its limited features, I can take something that is a compiled, that's a, a, a WASM binary that's been compiled against WASI, and I can run it, I can compile it on my Mac, run it on my Windows machine, run it on my Mac, run it on my Raspberry Pi over here, run it on a Linux um, VM somewhere, I, I can run it anywhere I want to. And so, um, it, the fact that it can already do that um, and, it, and it's on its way to defining these other things makes me think that there is a distinct possibility. But I, I, I don't think any of us know for sure that it might not just end up like any other, any other effort to make um, something more cross compatible across everything like POSIX was. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say the counter argument, and I'm just kind of playing the devil's advocate. The counter argument is that POSIX could do what you just described 30 years ago. So, so like, you know what, what do we what do we get now um but, but yeah I, and we'll I, we'll talk I, yeah i'm going to talk more about the specific benefits about why we said okay well why why did we we dip our toes into this like i know that a lot of these things can be done it just it enables it in a little bit different way and i'll get i'll get into that in does. just a little bit because i'm going to cover a little bit about why why we did the things we did with wasm cool. 
Good question, though. Um, so the other thing to that that I like to kind of make a specification and a difference here is, and I'm I'm talking to SIG runtime, so this is a little bit dumbed down for the audience. So pardon that. Uh, but the idea is just to kind of explain where we sit in kind of our layer of abstraction. So we all know what OCI is, I'm assuming in this meeting. Um, and we have, and we obviously that's kind of a little bit too low level for us. We actually thought as we were playing this, like, how could we enable WASM on, on Kubernetes? And we're like, well, can we implement it kind of like as an OCI, like with like a shim that's running underneath and all that. And, and honestly, the process model didn't work out the best for us. It was a little bit too much overhead and too tied to the idea of containers still. We also tried, and there's a, you can look it up, there's a repository called Walk inside of Deus Labs that um, was stand, that was Wasm on Kubernetes. Um, and we tried implementing the CRI interface, but the CRI interface uh, is way, way, way too container specific. Like we couldn't even test it against the normal testing tools because it makes the assumption that everything is a container no matter what, which I mean, that's not a problem, but that's just how it's defined. So that didn't work for us as well. We kind of went up to this virtual kubelet level um, and I'm pretty certain everyone knows what the virtual kubelet is. So it's the idea of like we're masking as a kubelet. So that's what Crestlib is doing in this case is it's masking as a kubelet, but it goes a little bit above and beyond um, the normal virtual kubelet and the fact that we're implementing other things that the kubelet has um, as if it were like a drop-in replacement for Kubelet. That's not it. That's not its purpose. But like we have a lot of the same kind of features. Like right now, I've been working on implementing the plugin watcher system, um, so we can have CSI plugins. Um, and so I just I have a PR open for that actually right now to land that. Um, and so those uh, th that's kind of the level that this that Crestlet sits at. Um, here is that we aren't an actual kubelet in the sense of like we're, we're doing the CRI and all that, but we're, we're performing a lot of the same functions and pretending to be a node no matter where it's running at. Okay, so here's to answer your question um, about the, well, why, why did we make this then? So there's kind of five big things here. Um, the first two are, are, are a little bit more self-explanatory. So there's a security aspect here. So Wasm is a completely sandboxed um, runtime. So <clears throat> you have to explicitly grant in permissions for it to do something. If you want to open a file, that, that uh, file has to be explicitly granted to the runtime to be able to use. And I'm assuming the same thing will hold true for network sockets and other things down the line. Um, this is another one where people have asked, like, well, there, people tried this kind of security model before. And once again, like, we don't know for sure that it's going to work this time, but given its success in the browser and its sandbox space, we think that this can still translate very well to, um, to a, an in, like in a server running model like we have with WASI. And so that security is something that, that is very um, uh, important to a lot of people. And that's one of those reasons we thought that WASM would be a good choice here. The other, um, the other reason is uh, density. So um, when we went from like bare, uh, bare uh, blades to VMs, we were able to start packing more stuff onto the compute power we had. And then we moved from VMs to um, Docker containers and Docker containers pack, could it allow you to pack it even better um, with the use of C groups and everything to make sure things weren't stomping on each other. Um, Wasm, uh, modules are even better at the density aspect. And that's, uh, that's something that ties into the last point about being a smaller footprint, but you can fit a lot of WASM modules because they're very tiny and run very light uh, into, a, into a small space. Um, obviously we haven't gotten to the whole resource constraints and everything that um, in the same, like how you have the resources block in Kubernetes to be able to find those things. We haven't gotten there yet and decided how that's gonna work but you can, you can push a lot more onto there. And a lot of these things are just essentially running on a task, or if you're familiar with Go, it's basically like a Go routine. And so if it's not doing anything, it just kind of gets parked. Um, and so you're not going to um, have like something that's just running still, because a container will still be running and taking up that, uh, some of that space that's required um, to just keep the container running. So that density is something that we have, um, we've also seen would be a really good uh, feature for a lot of people. Um, when I say uh, more control here, I'm referring not to anything outside of the project, but more internal to the project. When um, I'm referring to that part about we didn't use CRI because um, it was very hard to test it 
And uh, we often have people ask us like, well, why didn't you implement CRI or implement this? And um, it was just because right now this kind of virtual kublet level of abstraction we're at uh, gives us a lot more flexibility because all we have to do, our, our API contract with Kubernetes is that we just have to say we're a node and schedule things properly and update the status. Um, if there's something else down the future, down the line in the future, like a CRI v2 that's more flexible, um, we probably look at moving to that model and implementing that. I have a good um, question. So about the, the yeah. density part, basically you, um, w what you have now is uh, with the crosslet is, uh, you know, the, like a kubelet tied to a uh, WebAssembly binary, right? So with density, is that the plan, is the plan to have uh, multiple, um, uh, WebAssembly uh, binaries tied to the kubelet or, or because that it, it ties to a Kubernetes node. And so when people want to run WebAssembly nodes uh, using Kubernetes, so that interface is not already, it's not defined, uh, I believe, right? And that's where you want to get or? Uh, no, so right now it actually runs it just like a Kubernetes pod. So you can specify multiple modules as containers in a pod. You can have multiple pods running on the same node, um, just like you would a container. Um, so it can already run multiple on the same node, just fine. Got it. Got it. So, so it will be like a container will be a, a WebAssembly module, right? So, and, and, and that's how you. Yeah, it's it basically, um, we have made it pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping in the sense of like, you have a, a container and then you have a WASM module. Now they kind of, they're, they're a little bit different. They're not a one-to-one -one mapping in the technology itself, but they are in the, Kubernetes, like object parlance, like a module is just a container. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Makes sense. Yeah, we, for what it's worth, we ran into similar problems with people trying to run virtual machines on, you know, use Kubernetes to control virtual machines as opposed to containers. Um, and one of the popular uh, abstractions was, as you say, use pod as this, you know, pod is the thing that most of Kubernetes interacts with. And what's inside the pod is kind of uh, less important and it could be containers, it could be virtual machines and presumably it could be WASM model modules. Um, may maybe that's where you end up. Yeah, and that's, that's basically why we did the thing that we're doing, right? Like we're just handling pods and, and scheduling pods and running the things that those pods tell us to run. So that, that's, a, that's a completely correct assessment of it. Um, now, the last two things are really, are really interesting to me. I think they kind of expose a little bit more of the future of what some people are trying to do, at least what we've heard from people. I mean, this is still so new and bleeding edge. Um, one of the things that this is actually um, run anywhere, and I use that very loosely and with big air quotes around it on purpose because it's, no one wants to actually make that promise because we know it, that's never going to be the actual case. But in terms of comparing it with, with Docker, this... Um, Crustlet and, and Wasm stuff are not meant to supplant Docker. Um, there's plenty of workloads that actually work better in Docker and wouldn't be worth the effort to port them to Wasm, even if everything was in place with the WASI spec and all that. Um, but if we're being perfectly honest with ourselves, as much as we say Docker is work anywhere or more portable, it, it really isn't. It's just a Linux technology. I mean, I work, I work in Microsoft. I know there are some very smart people who have made Windows containers a thing that work well but they aren't even really the same thing. They work with very different um, underlying like hosts and libraries. Um, and if you build like an Nginx container, uh, you can't go run that on a, as a Windows container, like not running in a VM. Um, you compare that to WebAssembly modules and WebAssembly modules, like I said, I can compile it on one computer and run it on any other computer. And so, that is much more, like, that's why I'm saying run anywhere very loosely because there's, there's caveats to everything, but it is much more portable than a, a Docker container is in that sense because I can have any sort of, of node running this workload. I mean, even right now we have, like I said, that we have support for um, Mac, for w Windows, for ARCH64, and for um, Linux. And so um, for, for Crestlet itself. And so those things can run pretty much anywhere we want them to. Um, the last thing is kind of tied to the density, the smaller footprint. So Docker, as I think we all know if we've ever tried, like Docker ha has some pretty heavy overhead for smaller embedded devices. If you're on a Pi, you can run something like K3S, which is awesome. Um, I often use K3S for our uh, control plane, 
when I'm doing like a, a crustlet cluster out of Raspberry Pis. Um, and the smaller embedded devices are becoming more common. It's this idea of like the edge. I know it's kind of a buzzword still, but a, a WASM module has very little overhead and can run with a much smaller footprint than a container can. And so that's one of the reasons we have Crestlet is that um, we're, we're able to run on those smaller devices with much more ease than just having a full Docker overhead or container overhead. Um, I know people have gotten it working. And that's why I said it's not like a perfect thing, but I, I think it, it makes it a lot easier to work to run it on these smaller devices. And with one of the um, implementations we have, it's called a provider, which I'll go over in just a second. Those, um, those, uh, is called WASM3. It's actually optimized for the um, for the um, smaller embedded device runtimes. I have a question on that one. Yeah. So is, is that density mostly achieved by basically using the same process uh, super or having the having one WASM process that's running all these modules? Yes, so like there is there is one WASM process. Each process each WASM module has its own memory space. And there's a whole debate around the, well, what's the security model here um, We that people always ask about. And to be honest, that's not my forte, but I do know that that's still so like under debate right now and how exactly it'll work and what the implications are and what are the worries like, like when you run them all on the same, that same uh, parent process. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, that right now that's how it's done is we achieve the density from two things. Number one, the size of the WASM module, most WASM modules, like a simple, if, if you want to do like a simple, um, server demo or a simple, um, like hello world kind of example, even a Docker container still is several, like you're talking at least 10 to 20 megs. Um, a WASM module is bytes, um, kilobytes. Um, worst case scenario, maybe a meg. Um, so you get a huge size reduction there. And then also the fact that we're sharing that, that same kind of like parent thread and how I mentioned that because it's running just basically on like tasks, those tasks can get parked if it's not doing anything. Yeah. So like the, the image size is, is definitely one thing that I think traditional containers, I don't know if we have a name for that, but could, could never beat in terms of WASM just because like the, the operating system comes with the runtime basically with, with Wasm. But yeah, I was just thinking from like a Kubernetes perspective, like is it ideal to have like one per pod so you can still throw these processes in namespaces or C groups or something to add that extra layer of security on top of what kind of is in the Wasm process. Yeah, and that's maybe something that we can we can look at. Like, if, if this is something where people are, are getting interested in and want to try it out, like, that's the kind of thing we welcome the feedback on, and maybe we can wrap some of those things like it. The, the main thing around, like, relying on C groups is one of our, our drives from the beginning has been that this is cross-platform. And let me tell you, for the whole plugin system, boy, howdy, was that a, an adventure to, to get that working on all, like, Windows and Mac and Linux. And um, <clears throat> just because of, like, different the differences between operating systems and so anything we do we want to make sure it's as is, is, that it's cross-platform um which is why like looking at c groups directly is probably not a good option right now just because it's limited to, to the linux side of things well i think that's more for like adding a layer like if you're on windows you might have a different way of yeah of isolating the processes i mean c group is just how you would do it on linux um, yeah. If you're oh, no, totally. in Sorry. development, you wouldn't even bother, I would think. Yeah. And I think that's something that we, we will continue. Um, that this is where, because it's so bleeding edge with, um, with WASI, like we don't know, like we don't want to make an assumption about a security, like some of those, like if you want to add an additional like wrapper thing, like a C group around it, <clears throat> we don't want to make an assumption um, yet on how, how that works or what it'll look like because it is so new. <clears throat> one, one other question. Sorry, this is maybe slightly off topic, but not, hopefully it's useful to other people as well. So, so these uh, WASM modules are, are they uh, interpreted or are they compiled? And and if the latter, are they compiled just in time or are they compiled ahead of time? Both, all all of the above. So, like there, there's different compilers that that can be used in each one. I think the one we're using is a. I want to say it's ahead of time, but 
Um, there's there's just in time, there's ahead of time. Um, there's some that I think are just interpreted. Um, if we want to talk more of that, I can actually invite one of my coworkers who is like completely in like head first, knee deep in this space okay. inside the WASI community. Um, <clears throat> but I do know that there are multiple ways to do it. And yeah. um, it just depends on the kind of optimizations you want to do for obvious reasons that you choose yeah. one or the other. And just to, to contextualize my question, I mean, a lot of this debate is around portability and the, the ability to take high performance things and execute them on multiple different platforms. Um, and, you know, there have been many, many efforts over many, many years. And some of them are, you know, interpreted and then became just in time like Java kind of stuff. And then other stuff was binary only, um, but then has, you know, all of the challenges associated with, with non not necessarily portable binaries or emulation layers or whatever. So I was just kind of trying to fit, figure out which of those sort of three spaces this fits into. It seems like it can it can choose which of the three spaces if, if I interpret your answer correctly. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, I can either connect you directly with one of my coworkers or we can um, have them come back next time. If we have a next time we present, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, so anyway, um, let's see. I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we have in there before I demo it, and then the idea of what's a, uh, a provider in our in our uh, project. So basically, what we have implemented is we have the basic pod lifecycle, things like downward API support, environment variables, host path secret config map volumes, and then support across all those operating systems I mentioned. Um, we don't have the cloud provider volume types yet, but we're going to have it by the next release. Like I said, I, I just put in the, the plugin discovery system. So now we'll be able to implement CSI. Um, it'll look a little bit different because we're not going to have like a sidecar container on, on Wasm that's, that's running this, but like you'll be able to um, implement CSI things. Um, we haven't implemented some of the eventing stuff. Um, and we, we don't have full Kubernetes networking support yet. So we're not totally tied into that system. Um, yet, but that's actually going to be not this release, but the release after that we're we're targeting that. So um, this is this is just to make sure that people are clear. Like this is still very new um, because of the space that it's sitting in. So there's certain things that are still missing, but we're um, we're moving very quickly. We're hoping. Don't hold me to this. We're hoping for a uh, 1.0 release around February. Um, where we can say, okay, like now you can start using it for things. Like it's still very new. They're still missing things due to the space it's in, but it's like a so it's been solid and it's been tested and those kind of things. Um, now, I also just want to cover quickly the idea of what a provider is. Um, so we stole this term from virtual kubelet. So a pro um, the way Crescent works is actually just an abstract kubelet running system. And it delegates the logic to actually running the thing that you're trying to run to something called a provider. Um, and so you can actually implement a provider for anything. One of the other maintainers of the project actually has an OCI one um, that is implemented for Crestlet. So it can run normal containers um, using Crestlet. And um, we have two that we implement that are kind of in tree, and that's called Wask and Wazi. Um, Wask is another project that um, is out there in the community that is a uh, actor-based model. Um, it has a host runtime and it uses something called capabilities. And these capabilities are generally, um, it, well, they can be two different things. They can be provided by another Wasm module or they can be like a native capability, which is just a compi compiled against the operating system that's at. So um, Wask actually has network support because it uses the a native capability for your networking. Um, and so this model, this um, actor model allows you to hot swap things. So you can um, swap out a provider. So you could swap out the networking implementation and none of the other things have to know about it. Um, you can swap out um, any of the capabilities provided and the provider has no idea that that, or sorry, the, um, the other WAS module that's consuming those doesn't need to know that it changed. It just it just swaps it out. Um, it's added some strong security models on top of normal, uh, a strong security model on top of normal WASM modules. So we're talking um, some key signing, like it has to have a, it has to be signed and embedded with a token that um, validates that it's allowed to run in the, um, in the host that it's being provisioned to. Um, to be clear though, WASC is kind of a, a little bit of a, 
um, in across a kind of a square peg round hole because Wask is kind of its own ecosystem too. It can run its own um, thing outside of Kubernetes. It even has a cool feature called Lattice um, that allows you to arbitrarily connect in um, nodes into, uh, into like a cluster, like a meshed cluster. Um, and then those modules can talk across that, that lattice to each other. Um, but it, it has a whole bunch of support for things like streaming file storage and logging and all sorts of, all sorts of things that is pretty cool. But we also have the implementation um, for Crestlet. The, the, the downside is if you're going to use Wasp, it's kind of a buy into the ecosystem because it has a different application design than a traditional Kubernetes runtime. Um, the WASI provider is kind of the, uh, yeah, it's a minor comment. Uh, yeah. We had the WASC actually present in one of our meetings a couple. Yeah, I actually remember that. I think they, I, f I forgot that I saw that. Yeah, and I talked to them about it. Kevin is a, is a good Kevin, friend of ours. Yeah. We've, yeah, we've been collaborating with them for a while and actually we're moving the WASC provider um, out in under the WASC project umbrella here um, soon in the next few months, so. Yeah, and then he mentioned the crosslet too and how you guys are working, so. Yeah. yeah, it's great to see uh, collaboration. Right? So, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, I think one of the challenges also like uh, you know tying it all tying it all to Kubernetes, right? So when you um, because a lot of people are using Kubernetes, and then you're talking about maybe people using K3s, right? So, but uh, anyways, just a comment. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing, the, the providers are, are meant to offer flexibility anyway, and so that's why we have this model. So if someone wanted to implement one for you, know, like HashiCorp's Nomad, or if you wanted to implement something for um, like functions on like Azure or on, or on uh, AWS or on Google, you could do that with a provider. Um, but in this case, like we just have these two that we've we've supported, and WASI is kind of the more reference implementation of everything. So it follows the WASI standard. The problem is it doesn't have um, it doesn't have networking yet, as I mentioned. Um, and the WASI provider follows more of like the traditional Kubernetes runtime model. Not that it is a Kubernetes runtime, but that like you have a pod that serves as a um, that contains containers, right? And those containers, which are WASI modules. Um, are just acting as individual processes. They're not connected. Um, well, they're technically running on the same host if we're if we're talking the actual technical details, but they are um, following more of that that mental model that Kubernetes has. They're each kind of their own individual thing, and you can connect them using services and other stuff eventually when we get the networking support in. So that's kind of the overview of everything. Um, were there any other questions about kind of the details around the projects? Um, why we created it, anything else before I kind of, before I go into the demo and kind of show how it works? Don't have any, so yeah. Okay. I'd be curious okay. on kind of some of the contributors you have to it and some of the use cases um, today. Are there any production use cases? Like what uh, do you see on the horizon? There are no production use cases for, uh, the reason that this is still so new, we still had the warning on there, the big warning sign that says, do not use this in production, please. Um, so we don't know that anyone's using it in production. I, I hope nobody is yet, um, but we have had a lot of people connecting it and trying things in various ways. So we've seen, um, was it, uh, there's one of, someone in the community from o Octale, Octa however you say that, that company's name, um, who did a demonstration like using OpenFAS and Crustlet and WASM modules, which was really interesting. Um, I know that a lot of people who've reached out to us are in the like IoT edge space because um, there, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of work done recently in trying to kind of how can we use Kubernetes to schedule things out to these like edge, these very like leaf nodes at the very, very edge of things. Um, and so we've seen a lot of uh, people talking about it there. Um, uh, I'm assuming whoever uses Wask has probably also looked at some of this stuff if they if they do Kubernetes things as well. Um, we've mostly just been trying to get like things implemented all the way out before we've been focusing on like oh here's uh, the use case study of company X and company Y uh, right now. But I do know that those are the kinds of people who've been reaching out is mostly the people who are kind of tinkering on the edge saying well I want to try doing things with Wasm and then people who are doing IoT edge stuff is kind of the big categories that we've seen. 
and like that I guess this also addresses it a little bit. So like this is kind of our next steps of what we're doing. Um, and 0 0.8 is kind of going to be that thing where we solidify more of the demos. We have some basic demos, which I'll show, but like solidifying some more production like demos or that's something that people can use as a as a uh, reference um, for an actual real real world application. And so that's kind of why we're I'm trying to get things done like CSI volume support and full networking support because those are kind of critical to do the full real world um, examples that people want to see. So I have a question. So uh, when when you talk about uh, WASM modules, uh, uh, do people actually want to pack more capabilities within, or, or, or like a WebAssembly uh, binary, right? Do we want to add more capabilities inside that, or they just want to decouple more of the little components and then run these in all kinds of different places? Uh, I would imagine that that you you have the capability capability to to create the the modules with you know either heavy or or, or lightweight right but uh, what have you heard of uh, how they want to run these modules or or is it up in up in the air on you know how people want to run them? It's still up in the air. So Wask focuses on very small modules because it's an actor mod, right? So each thing each module is supposed to be an actor in the system. So it's supposed to do one specific task. Um, and so those are, are meant to be very small. Um, I imagine that just like with containers, we'll see a little bit of both, but I, we don't have enough like real world usage to like completely guarantee that that's going to be the case. But I think that we'll see a little bit of, of uh, both use cases there. I'm guessing though that initially it'll probably be the smaller constrained workloads that'll be the first targets that people try doing just because they're smaller and they're easier to get going than to like do something bigger inside of, inside of a, a WASI compiled um, binary. And so I, I think that'll change as WASI gets more and more things solidified, but I am not sure is the complete truthful answer. Cool, cool, yeah. Thanks. Um, Anyway, so let's, I'm going to go ahead and demo um, and kind of explain the, uh, the architecture as well about, about how it works. Um, if we have extra time, people are curious, I can kind of explain why we did Rust and the draw, the, why, if it went, why, why it has gone well, some of the drawbacks and all that, if people are curious, but otherwise I'm just going to go through the demo and the architecture real quick. So let me switch screens really quick. Okay, let me increase the font size real quick. Okay, so um, double check that my cluster didn't die. So I was going to try to have a, what I was calling a Franklin cluster altogether, but of course the demo gods conspired against me. Um, I was gonna have a random Windows VM connected and my Raspberry Pi connected, but then my Raspberry Pis had issues and I couldn't connect, and like I couldn't like even get into it over SSH and my Windows machine was having problems. So of course, I'm not gonna be able to show it, but I promise if you take these, you can run these on, on any operating system. I'm not just making that up, um, but such is the life of uh, working with a uh, demo. So right now I'm just pointing at Minikube. You can run, the, we have instructions for uh, most of the major cloud providers at this point. Um, if you use another cloud provider and you find a problem with it, um, or you, there's not documentation, that's something we're always looking for is more documentation there. Um, so you can run it against anything. The, the two requirements are, are um, that you need to be able to create a bootstrap token. Um, so you can generate a, a bootstrap config. Um, and uh, the other requirement is that you need to um, be able to be in a place where the Kubernetes control plane can reach you over the internet somehow, whether that's through a tunnel or, or something else. So one of the things that I do if I'm if I'm running like a local machine against like an AKS cluster, I will use inlets to just to set that up. I, do, I don't have that set up now. And that's why I'm doing it on Minikube um, because you need that endpoint coming back so that, that um, the control plane can ask the kubelet for the container logs. Um, if you don't want to worry about logs, you don't even need that. You just need the bootstrap token. So I'm actually going to clear this all out so you can all see what it looks like. Um,
So there is a bootstrap script that's included. Um, and this is one of those things towards the end we're hoping we can just have kind of a one click process. Um, and don't worry about just, it's just a tool we're using. Um, and so this bootstrap script is just creating a bootstrap token. I can actually show it because this is an audience that might actually care. Um, is. So we have one for Windows and for, and for uh, Linux or Unix-like systems, I should say. Um, and this is just doing basically a, exactly what kubeadmin does. It's creating a token um, and then creating the secret. So you'll need admin credentials to your, to your cluster to do this. Um, and then creating the secret in the proper location and then generating a kube config for the, um, for the bootstrapping process. And so we can actually see that right here that um, it's set up and has that token that was generated. And so it'll do all the bootstrapping. So it has the, the bootstrapping process um, implemented from, from normal kubelet. And so now when I start it, um, I'm just going to use a shortcut. This is just going to compile it and pass in the right flags. I actually can show you what it looks like. So I'm just going to be running the WASI provider right here. And so it's just running the, the, um, the Crescent WASI binary with the proper flags to give it a no name, what port it's listening on, the certificate it wants to use or output to. Um, and so when I run that, And I thought it was built, but maybe I made a change. So it's going to go ahead and start up and run. And while that's running, I'm going to come over here. And I will run just run Wask in just a second here. Like I said, the demo gods have not been smiling on me lately um, <laughs> because I just compiled this last night and apparently I accidentally made a change somewhere. It's compiling right now, right? Yeah, it's just compiling down here. It's just doing the final linking step. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so you can see it running and it tells me, okay, I'm ready for you to bootstrap. So it's going to, um, I, I, you have to manually, so if you have it set up properly, Kubelet will automatically approve the, um, the client certificate for authentication, but you have to manually approve the certificate for, um, for the TLS that it's going to serve its endpoint on. So um, I'll go ahead and approve it right over here. And now that's been approved and we see back here that it's going to run. Um, right now, one of the little bugs we have we can't figure out is we can't tell Kube Proxy to stay away because it tolerates everything. Um, but you can see that it's up and running and trying to, trying to do its thing. Um, <clears throat> then um, uh, and we'll go ahead and do um, just so I can show both of them. Just run WASC. Okay. So while WASC is sitting here running, I'm going to go ahead and create um, an, an example demo here. So we have a couple of these in um, the main tree. So I'm going to do kube control apply. So we actually have a, a couple different examples of um, of each one. So in this case, we have examples in pretty much all the languages. We have uh, one that support, that have like really good WASI support. There's more languages they're adding each time. We have one in C, one in Rust, and one in assembly script um, that were all compiled in their own language down to WASI. Um, so we'll go ahead and do the one in C just for fun. Um, so it's going to create a simple config map in a pod. And we can actually see kube control get pods. Um, it ran, so this isn't a long running pod. It's just outputting a few things and so yeah, it ran to completion. 
and I can do kube control logs on it. And I get back the logs from inside of that pod. So in this case, it was just printing out a bunch of things that were mounted from the config map. And if we look at the actual manifest, um, you'll see that it looks pretty much just normal. So um, we actually store our images in a, um, or uh, sorry, our uh, modules in a, uh, an OCI compatible registry. Um, it's pulled down from there. We've mapped things in from the, uh, from the uh, downward API, from the config map that's, that's linked in. The only thing that's different is we have to make sure we node select on the arch that we're looking for and tolerate those nodes because we have it set up so that um, those nodes repel all normal pods in case you're running in a heterogeneous environment. Um, and so the thing is, is now I can, I can delete, after I delete that pod, so let's um, go ahead and delete that. And let's go ahead and do uh, rest. Oops, ha. Change that to apply. Okay, so now Rust was created, and before I continue, I'm gonna quickly approve this guy's certificate. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so now if I say kube control, get, or sorry, uh, logs, actually no, I'll get pods first. Okay, we'll see that it ran to completion. It's, do, it's the same thing, just written in Rust. Um, and then we can get logs. Um, and we actually print out a file in this case and we're reading a file from the system and we have um, the, the same kind of values there. So these are written in two different languages compiled to the same target and you can run this module anywhere. So it can run, uh, if you're on a Windows machine, you could run it right now. If you're on a, on a Raspberry Pi, you can run it over there. Um, and so um, that's, that's the beauty of this is you can move it around to these different systems um, as you want, whatever type of, of nodes you have connected. So um, there's, there's just the simple example for that. You can also see, just to show this is um, running, you'll see that we have these two um, nodes that have been created. Um, and so those are, um, those are all running and connected with a normal kubelet um, serving certificate. So the last one, just a quick uh, WASC example. Let's go ahead and just do uppercase. Okay, so this one is actually gonna do something a little bit different. Um, we'll see that this is running now and it is actually serving, like I said, we don't have the networking connected up, but this is actually serving on a networking endpoint. So if I do curl, Um, and pass foobar, it actually returns back and it's running a, running a server that's returning back and uppercasing everything I send at it. Um, and this, this uh, WebAssembly binary is actually super, super tiny because it doesn't have to worry about the server that's handled by another um, capability within the WASP provider. But you can also do um, some limited networking things right now with the WASP provider. So um, there's just the simple demo of this running. And once again, this would run on any system. Um, wherever you want it to run. Uh, so it's just, it's just a really nice portable thing that we have. So anyway, there's just a quick demo. And um, that's all I had for, for demos right now. Were there any questions? Yes. Yeah, on the crustlet, when you have a different crustlet for WASC and WASI, right? So for the first two examples, you ran it on the WASI crustlet, right? And the last one was something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if we look at the actual, um, if we look at this uh, file right here, you'll see that it's selecting on, I don't know why it's selecting on Linux, that's not supposed to be there, but anyway, um, you'll select on WASM32 WASC, and it's the same thing with the, the tolerations right here. They're set to repel things that aren't its proper runtime. Got it. I'd, so you, you, on the initial step, you you actually built the the crosslet for both, right? So I think that's what what you did initially, right? So I, 
I'm yeah, sorry. it was just compiling it locally. There's there's pre-compiled binaries available for download. I was just doing it straight from. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. it. So you need to build. Okay, so there's pre-compile if you want to. I got it. Yeah. yeah. It, there we have installation instructions and everything um, in, in our docs folder in the repository. Um, I just compiled it directly because it was just on my machine. Um, and also because I thought I had already compiled that last step recently, but apparently no. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Any other questions there? Okay, so that's that's what I had for that. Were there any other questions around the project, what we did? People want to know anything else about it? Yeah, you mentioned about Rust, right? So what, uh, uh, why did you choose uh, Rust? Um, well, okay, so it actually might just be easier to, I don't know that. Um, to just show some examples here. Um, so these are the four reasons that we, we picked Rust. The first and most important is that um, WASM and WASI support is the best in Rust. Um, I don't know why that started out that way, but that's what it is right now. And so it has first class support for compiling to, to um, WASI. You just basically have to add a compilation target um, and then just say cargo build, which is the build tool, cargo build target, WASM32 WASI. Um, and so it will, um, it, it's because of that, a lot of, of the uh, WebAssembly things and the, the WASI things are built in Rust. And so um, that's why, why one of the biggest reasons we chose it. Um, and I know that we, people often ask this because actually our team, so like our team, I, I'm still one of the core maintainers of Helm. Our team has like lots of experience in Go and other Kubernetes things. Um, and then the other three things are uh, the safety, which is all around um, what, I guess it's the, the memory management model of Rust. So Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, but it has a very strict um, ownership mo um, model. And um, if you've ever heard of somebody who started with Rust, you'll hear about fighting with the borrow checker. So <laughs> that's checking that all your data is going to the right places. And, and this is very powerful. It leads to longer compile times but honestly, the trade-offs have been have been really good because of it. Um, they have uh, it's, it's caught bugs that we would ha we wouldn't have caught otherwise. And there's certain bugs that we would see, like we found one in Helm that would have been caught by the Rust compiler had it been in Rust because we were accidentally sharing data and creating a race condition that not even the race checker caught. Um, and th it doesn't that those kind of classes of bugs are entirely um, eliminated with with rust there's still plenty of bugs this isn't like some magic bullet but it, it avoids a whole it avoids whole classes of bugs and avoids there's not going to be null pointer dereferencing or anything like that unless you're doing explicitly unsafe code which has to be called out as unsafe in your in your actual code so you know exactly where it's happening um the other two things were just more like bonus features which were the extensibility and developer experience and by extensibility i mean here's an example I mean, if I want to pass a specific client, I mean, I have to implement like the whole interface or whatever, whereas with the generic support that's in um, Rust, I can build a custom type that handles almost any object. Um, and this can actually be used all uh, with like a CRD. So the CRD stuff is actually really easy with macros, um, which is just compile time code generation in Rust. You can generate a, a CRD <clears throat> and use the exact same API client interface that you would um, for a pod or anything else. Um, and so that flexibility is very, very nice with Kubernetes where there's many things that behave very close to each other with just some slight differences that can be handled by um, Rust fairly easily. I mean, there's, I have some other examples here, but there's not a lot of time to talk over it. It was just about how those, those things have been very helpful. Um, and then the other thing has been around developer experience. Um, as someone who has done a ton of Kubernetes things in, in Go and a lot of things in Go in general, like doing um, <clears throat> it, basically doing anything where you have to do large projects against the Kubernetes libraries or API, it's an absolute nightmare um, in Go to upgrade or add any library dependency. 
because um, some of them have different versioning schemes and there's so you have to often figure out like specific hashes to get things to compile or specific pinned versions. Um, happens to us in Helm all the time. Um, in Cargo, it's pretty simple. You just kind of look like this and there's also conditional compilation. So we offer features like this, this ops thing as a way to opt into using CLI flags that we have. If you don't want to use the CLI flags, then you just turn off the feature called CLI. Um, and then you'll just be using our normal config objects. You won't even get the dependencies or the, um, the dependencies it pulls in or the code that's there because it'll be omitted um, when it's being compiled. And so um, you just pull in exactly and only what you need, which we found for dependency management being very, very nice. And also kind of like what I mentioned with some of the other things, there's macros, how error handling works the flow control, there's this idea of results and unwraps and how, and how you get everything to work is great. But last, just to cover it, there are caveats there. The Kubernetes library in Rust is missing some of the more advanced features. So um, streaming manifests in from uh, like a list of manifests like we do in, in Helm a lot. Um, some of the patch creation and other things are just, are just not there and probably won't be for a little while. There's just very advanced features that more like advanced projects might miss. And I really miss Go's just like ease, ease of starting something async, or sorry, I should say concurrently. Um, I can just say Go, Go, whatever, and just shove off something onto a Go routine. Whereas in Rust, there's async, there's two kind of competing async runtimes, and they're all kind of a nightmare to like try to figure out which one you want to use. And if you do it, you're kind of bought into it. And Rust kind of has a really steep learning curve. But what we have found is that once you get used to the language, it is very powerful and offers a lot more flexibility and safety when writing these kind of cloud native applications. Um, and so that was just kind of the extra benefits that came on top of us choosing Rust primarily for the safety and WASM side of things. So hopefully that answers that question, but I know we're at 10 o'clock, so I don't want to. Yeah, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. And I think it was really helpful and informational. So. Quentin, do you have any last? All good? Was that a good thumbs up or like, I, mean, eh. I have to run, so yeah. thank yeah. you. That was very useful. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.